Burma's new name is the Union of Myanmar, and uh, a major ongoing threat to the stability and future economic prospects of this nation comes from various armed rebel groups and ethnic minorities challenging that union. A key challenge is from 800,000 Rohingya Muslims who are stateless. The UN labels them one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. Well, Abul Tahay is chair of the Union National Development Party, a largely ethnic Rohingya party. We asked that he come to this debate, but he couldn't get access. Uh, so I went to his office in Yangon, where he recorded this question for this debate. Rohingya as well as Muslim communities have been denied full flash citizenship since 1982 citizenship law comes into operations which contravenes universal declarations of human rights. My question is, shouldn't it change by leaders with retrospective effect? And isn't it an obligation of leaders to protect minorities from the influence of majorities to promote rights and integrations? Thank you. Minister, the obligation of governments to protect minorities, like the Rohingya. So we have to protect the people's security. Now that day, before that, we are thinking about national security, including that we, we give more uh, focus and more share to the, the trend has changed to people's security. That is, the, what I mean is the community security, you know, human rights security, then political security, personal security, health security, environmental security, economic security, food security, such like that. In future, we have to do, we have to protect the whole, those who stay in our territory. That's our duty. But that human, rights, also monitor, in the here. human rights monitors yes. are claiming that the army is condoning and even participating against the nation's Muslim minority. No, we, that is a very complicated thing. We have to discuss it all just like the commission and something like that. Well, let's get a reflection on this. If we can go to uh, Chant Mint U, who's a historian, about how important this ethnic minority issue is for the future of Myanmar. It's critical. I mean, in one way, this has been an issue that's been with the country since independence or even before independence. Myanmar was a multi-ethnic, multicultural country before British times. In British times, the colonial power ruled different parts of the country differently. There were lots of immigrants who had come from India over the 50, 100 years of colonial rule. And so this question of what is it to be Burmese or to be Myanmar has been a central question throughout our politics since 1948. The civil war, the armed conflicts began in 1948-49, partly on issues of identity, partly on issues of nationalism. We are now at the end of, we hope, of 70 years of armed conflict in this country. And I think everyone accepts that there is no way forward, there's no way towards democracy, there's no way towards economic development until the armed conflicts are resolved. But around that is a much broader issue of what does it mean to be Myanmar? Uh, how can we forge a more inclusive national identity? It's not just about the Myanmar Burmese majority and different ethnic minorities. We have millions of uh, Myanmar people in Thailand. Are the children born there Myanmar or not? We have immigrants, Chinese immigrants, for instance, from, from, from China who've come in over the last 10 years. Are there children who were born here in Myanmar or not? I mean, there's a much broader issue of inclusiveness and identity that's central, I think, to the politics of this country. Abu Tahay uh, has met President Obama and British Prime Minister in Rangoon, David Cameron, that is, but not yet Aung San Suu Kyi. So he had this question for you, mentioning that you're the daughter of General Aung San, the country's independence hero. For Aung San Suu Kyi, I have three key points to highlight. The first one is Rohingya issues as were well resolved by our national hero, General Aung San. The Aung San Suu Kyi is daughter of General Aung San. Second point, the Aung San Suu Kyi is internationally recognized democratic icon. And the Aung San Suu Kyi also Nobel Peace Literate. That is why Don San Suu Kyi has obligation to come up the concrete common grounds to resolve the Rohingya issues for the sake of nations and people of this country.
Aung San Suu Kyi, real expectation on you particularly uh, to resolve this issue of citizenship for a minority like the Rohingyas? Well, at the moment, nobody seems to be very satisfied with me because I'm not taking sides. Uh, but let's look at it this way. I believe in rule of law. I think that the first necessity is rule of law. In the Rakhine, until people feel safe, until people can be sure that they will not be killed in bed or their houses burned above them, they're not going to talk to each other and there is, no going to be gen there is not going to be any kind of genuine reconciliation. So because I believe in rule of law, first of all, I believe that everybody must be entitled to security under the present administration and that the administration must do everything possible to ensure the security of all peoples in our country whatever their race whatever their religion and secondly when I say rule of law, it also means the law with regard to citizenship and that I look at it in two steps. First of all are all those who are entitled to citizenship under the 1982 law now citizens? Have they been given citizenship in accordance with the 1982 law? That is the first thing we have to look at. And then secondly, we must reassess the 1982 law to see if it is in line with international norms. That is what rule of law means and it's not an exciting answer that I'm giving you and people don't like it because they prefer the sort of things that they can flash in the headlines. Well, pra pragmatism is clearly uh, a way ahead but what is fascinating is the number of people who've contacted us in advance like uh, Yusra Bentri from Magnus in Morocco, how can a Peace Nobel Prize winner uh, stand silent when an ethnic cleansing is going on in your own country? Patrick Pitts, based in the UK, why is Aung San Suu Kyi silent about the massacre? I have of, not of, been of, silent. I, I'm merely asking the questions uh, which others are putting. People who are now very aware of what is happening with the ethnic minorities in your country? Well, first of all, as I said, I have not been silent. It's just that they're not hearing what they want to hear from me. But I cannot doctor my answers to please everybody. I have to say what I believe in. And I believe that rule of law is the first step towards any kind of solution to the problem in the Rakhine state and other parts of this country. And of course, that's not an exciting answer. So people would rather think that I was not saying anything than that I was saying something so boring that they'd rather not hear. But it is a practical need. And as I said, then we must go get to the point of reassessing the law to see if it comes up to international norms or not. And I would like people all over the world to understand that we are aware of the difficulties in our country and we are doing our best to cope with it. When I say we, I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about ordinary people in Burma because Burma is made up of different races and different uh, religions. And uh, I, I really must take up this question of Burma, Myanmar, which you mentioned just now. It reminds me very much of a line by, I think, Paul Collier in his book, that it's, easy to, it's easier to rename a country than to change it. As you know, Burma was renamed Myanmar sometime under, this, uh, in, under the previous military regime. 19, what, 19, 91, 92? Well, suddenly one day they decided that they were going to change the name of the country. Now, the reason why I stick to the, uh, to the name Burma is because the country was not changed uh, in accordance with the will of the people. The people had nothing to do with it. And also, I think that there was something intrinsically dishonest about the change in name. The, the, the implication that Myanmar refers to all the ethnic nationalities of Burma, which it does not. Myanmar is simply a literary form of Bama, which means just the Burmese ethnic group. So I would want to make this quite clear, because if we are going to resolve our problems, we've got to face them squarely. It's not going to make them go away simply by putting a different name onto it. And it's the same thing with the problem of our Muslims in Burma. It's a big problem, it's a complicated problem, particularly because uh, Islam has spread worldwide and there are Islamic links everywhere and anything that happens everywhere in the world is known immediately. Zinma, um, when you hear that, what's your view? Because 40% of your country's population is uh, an ethnic minority one way or the other. 
How do you get reconciliation? Do you have optimism that there are 13 agreements now, at least ceasefires in place? A 14th agreement was put in place last week. Is that showing a determination to at least address these issues now? Regarding to the reconciliation, we, most all the, um, the ethnics, including the bombers, are uh, re, uh, socialized by the, the past regime. So uh, it, uh, I think that it takes time. So that's why in the past, uh, when the, the fight between the KIA and the Burmese military fight, uh, we visited, I have been there for four times to the ITB camps. I just want to explain then, the fighting is just between the Burmese military, uh, government military and the KIA, not fighting between the Burmese people and the Kachin people. That is, uh, I always would like to raise uh, the, uh, the sense of the fightings and the, between the ethnic peoples and Burmese uh, majority. Well, as we heard from Utan Min there, this is so critical for the future of your country. Um, and what I'd like to ask you, Usatain, based on one of the tweets we've had uh, from Taswin Ayungiji, I hope that's pronounced correctly, from Burma, the co-founder of the World with Conscience, is federalism potentially the solution for the ethnic conflict? Sure, what you have said is uh, absolutely correct. What we are going on is uh, after the ceasefire or ceasefire agreement, some agreement, what you have said, then we are uh, now doing on the uh, framework for political dialogue. Then we start doing the political dialogue all inclusive as a meeting, huge meeting. Then we are thinking about the, what you said about the federalism. That is a sharing of power, sharing of resource, just like, for example, in Germany is doing such kind of federalism. Federalism is not the, you know, those days, 1962, the people are afraid of federalism as a ghost. Federalism means other, other definition. Now federalism is not like definition. It's a power sharing and resource sharing and equality for the nation and races people. One of the critical reasons for addressing the ethnic minorities and the activists, of course, is the economy. Because people want to invest here, but they want to know it's a stable country. And Myanmar has the lowest output per person in Southeast Asia. President Ten Sen said publicly, there are still too many people whose life is a battle against poverty. It's a hand-to-mouth existence. But one new analysis says Myanmar has major advantages which could generate in 15 years economic wealth four times what it is today. Let's go to Stephen Groff, who's uh, Vice President of the Asia Development Bank, um, where you're analyzing week by week both the issues in Myanmar and also the potential. We have questions around uh, issues around inclusiveness and how inclusive growth will be in the future. I think we heard, we heard questions earlier about you know, the reforms not being people, poor people not yet benefiting from this reform process. So it, again, when we think about economic development, when we think about investment, we need to be thinking about economic development investment that's going to benefit the 70 percent of the country that lives you know, in, in quite dire straits. And so I think that this is going to be the critical question and this is going to be the critical challenge of the, of the country moving forward. We are the rich resource country. Everybody knows that. For the transparent and accountable, we just, uh, as a candidate of the EITI members, that is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiatives. Uh, after that kind of things, we are the member of that kind of the association. Uh, that will be transparent. That is the government and company and the civil society. You can check how much revenue we have. Then it, all transparent and all the ethnic people, they understand how much revenue you, are, you uh, the country get for that uh, issue. And another thing is the, uh, what I already mentioned about the resource sharing. So that's, that's at the time, everybody can <clears throat> you know, get the benefit from the resource. On San Suu Kyi, this issue of inclusiveness, how much do you fear that this will not happen? Not least because of the level of cronyism, and that's a, an extraordinary word I keep hearing being repeated here. Cronies, those who are too close to the military and the former governments who've made their money but not benefited the people at the bottom. I think you have to be a little careful about that because some people who made a lot of money uh, over the last two decades are 
are now supporting many humanitarian activities and I've accepted their donations in order to help humanitarian causes. I have no uh, compunctions about that because I think it's better that they should use their money in that way rather than, uh, for example, buying another private jet or something like that. But uh, with regard to inclusiveness, uh, for our society to be really inclusive, we have to look to our rural community because almost 70% of our people live in the rural areas and uh, their living depends on agriculture. So if we want to be, if we want our process to be inclusive, it means that there must be a greater share for everybody in the economic growth and development that we expect. And uh, I have been making the point over the last um, few months because since we entered 2013, that we're now entering the third year of reform. And all right, good intentions are very well, but what we now want to do to see our results in the way of a real change in the lives of our people. And if you talk to the man on the street, if you talk to uh, people in a village, a woman in a village, the great majority of them would say that their lives have not changed in any way since 2010. One thing is that, you know, to, to amend the constitution. And the second thing is develop and the, um, the, um, to develop the mechanism for the rule of law. And the third one is the uh, infrastructure. And the last one is that for, I would like to focus on the young people. According to the uh, uh, Asia Development uh, Bank report, the, um, there's a 18% of the young people, the age between 13 and 18, who are the 40% of workforce. So in here in Burma, there is a no more opportunity and get to get the decent employment, to get a proper training, to get a, a proper jobs for the young people. That they I think the current government has lack of mechanism to create jobs for the young people. Tadmid, who as the historian. When you look at the legacy that's now left by the military uh, control of this country and what those particularly in the country expect, what's your analysis? I mean, there are questions of political will. There are questions of institutional capacity. There's the questions of mentalities that have been created over 60 years of military rule, 60 years of isolation from, from the outside world. I mean, we have to appreciate that what is going on here is something quite unique. I mean, I think we all hope that we're at the beginning of a lasting political transition towards more democratic government. We hope that we're moving from the old type of state-centered economy to one that is more based on freer markets. And we all hope that we can put the armed conflicts behind this, uh, behind us. But this is all happening at a time when the country is also being de-isolated the, for, for the first time in decades. I think any country would have difficulty in making this kind of transformation. But if you put into the equation as well, these legacies of military rule, the legacies of the way in which the education system has been systematically underfunded, dismantled over decades. I mean, these are, this is a very unique challenge. Aung San Suu Kyi, the final word uh, in this debate to you uh, from the panel, because you have pushed so long and hard on the issue of skills and education. Can the need be matched in this country or not? Yes, because we will have to do it. We don't have a choice. If we do not match the need, then we will not be able to stay the course. So it's not a matter of whether it can be matched or not. It will have to be matched. Can it be done? Yes. Provided, of course, you amend the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> and with you as president? Yes. <laughs> As I bring this debate to a close, can I just uh, turn to Yun Mon Han? You're, you've come back to this country. You are trying to help people who are looking for a future. How do you feel about the debate we've had here? Does it give you optimism? I am cautiously optimistic about the future. Um, I have seen many changes before me, and they've been positive. And from a systemic level, I do believe we are on the forward path to democracy. It may not be perfect. Um, but there are other countries who have been struggling with the issue of democracy for 200, 300 years, and it's still not a perfect system. So we do need to be patient with the process. And something that I would like to encourage the change makers in this room is to actually give a greater communication channel to the people. Um, 
because they also need to be guided and encouraged to speak out on issues that are important to them. And right now, this is the freest we've been in 60 years. And some of the agenda items we have, you know, from the bottom up, it's cheap SIM cards, it's Korean soap operas, it's, you know, ethnic violence. And I really think we need to start working with the government hand in hand to create a better future for our next generation, uh, young people like myself. Well, can I thank all our panel here in Ecuador? To Minister Usatain, thank you very much indeed, Aung San Suu Kyi, and of course, uh, Zinma as well. Thank you for joining us here, being so frank and confirming you'd like to be president one day, Aung San Suu Kyi. <laughs> You've heard it first here. Um, from all of us here, this is for our audience at the BBC on television, on radio and online. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. From me, Nick Gowing, here in Ecuador. Bye-bye. <laughs>